Hello everyone, welcome to theCUBE's live here in Dallas, Texas. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Of course, we've got the three fabulous guests here, myself, Savannah Peterson. Savannah, you look wonderful. Thank you, John. I, I feel lucky to play the part here with my 10-gallon hat. <laughs> Dave Nicholson, who's the analyst, uncovering all the Dell, supercomputing, HPE, all the technology that's changing the game. Dave, you look great. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, John, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so, we're, so, so you look good. So we're in Dallas, um, Texas, it's a trade show, conference, I don't know what you call this these days, but thousands of booths are here. What's the take here? Why Supercomputing 22, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is dramatic incremental progress in terms of supercomputing capability, so um, what this conference represents is the leading edge in what IT can deliver to the world. Uh, we're talking about scale that is impossible to comprehend with the human brain, but you can toss out facts and figures like uh, performance measured in exaflops, uh, millions of CPU cores working together, um, thousands of kilowatts of power required to power these systems. And uh, I think what makes, this, what makes this show unique is that it's not just a bunch of vendors, um, but it's academia. It's PhD candidates coming and looking for companies that they might work with. So it's a very, very different vibe here. Savannah, we were talking last night before we were setting up our agenda for what to drill down on this week. And you know, you were, by the way, that looks great. <laughs> I, mean, I wish I had one. Um, <laughs> we'll get you one by the end of the show, the, John, the, don't worry. You know, Texas is always big in Texas, and that's the, the, the thing here. But supercomputing seems like it had a lull for a while. Yeah. It, it seems like it's going to explode. And you had a chance to review the papers, take a look at it. You know, you're, you're a, I won't say closet hardware nerd, but that's your roots. Yeah, yeah, very, very openly hardware nerd. And, and I'm excited because I, we saw a lot of hype around quantum and around AI five, 10 years ago, but we weren't seeing the application at scale. And we also weren't seeing, quite frankly, the hardware wasn't ready to power these types of endeavors at scale. Whereas now, you know, we've got, we've got air cooling, we've got liquid cooling, we've got multiple GPUs. Dell was just showing me all eight of theirs that they put in their beautiful uh, million dollar piece of equipment, which is extremely impressive for folks to run complex calculations. And uh, but what I'm excited about with all the, I, I love when we fuse business and academia together. I think that that doesn't happen very often. I've been impressed. I mean, when I walked in today right away, I'm sure y'all can't see this at home just yet, but we'll try and give you a feel over the course of the next two days. This conference is huge. This is, yeah, it is. way bigger than I was expecting you know, a lot larger than where we just were in Detroit. And, and I love it because we've got the people that are literally inventing the calculations that will determine a lot of our future from sequencing our genome to powering our weather forecasting, as well as all of the companies that create the hardware and the software that's going to actually support yeah. that, those algorithms and those And the, and the science get. and the engineering involved has just been going on since 1988. This conference, this a trade show, going on since 1988, which is, it, it passes the test of time, and now the future with all the new use cases emerging from the compute and supercomputing architectures out there, it's from cradle to grave. If you're, if you're in this business, you can, you're in school all the way through the industry. It doesn't seem to stop. That, that university student side of it, I mean, that whole student section here, so you don't see that very often in some of these tech shows. No. It's like from students to boardroom. Yeah, I actually brought the supercomputer from 1988 with me. <laughs> in my pocket, um, and I'm not sure that I'm even joking. I, this may have as much processing power, certainly as much storage, with one terabyte on board. I sprung for the one terabyte, folks. Uh, but nice. it is mind-boggling, the amount of compute power we're talking about. Um, when you dig below the surface, which we'll be doing in the coming days, um, you see things like leaping from PCIe, you know, Gen 4 to Gen 5, and the increase that that gives us in, in terms of capabilities for plugging into the motherboard and accessing the CPU complex and on and on and on. But, but you know, something Savannah alluded to, um, we're talking about the leading edge of what is possible from a humanity perspective. 100%. Um, and, and so I'd like to get into, you know, as we're, we're talking to some of the experts that we'll get a chance to talk to, uh, I'd like to get their view on what the future holds and whether we can simply grow through quantitative increases in compute power or if the real promise is 
out there in the land of quantum computing? Are we all sort of hanging our hats, our large 10 gallon hats? Our if hats? That's, yes, our hats. Yeah. If we're hanging our hats on that, that that's when truly we'll be able to tease insight out of chaos. Um, I'd like to hear from some of the real experts on that subject. I'm glad you brought that up, because I'm personally pretty pumped about quantum computing, but I've seen it sit in this hype stage for quite a while, and I'm ready for the application, so I'm curious to hear what our experts That's an awesome, that would be, I think that would be an awesome bumper sticker, frankly, Savannah. <laughs> I'm pumped, I'm pumped about quantum computing. It's yeah. like, who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> who is this person? <laughs> I want to see it first. Can someone show me it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm 400 in. qubits, I think, was the latest uh, IBM announcement. Which, uh, which means something, uh, I'll pretend like I completely understand what it means. Tell us what that means, what it means. Well, okay, well so, so Savannah, <laughs> let me mansplain let's, it to you. Yeah, let's hear it. So, so it's, uh, basically it's, you know, in conventional computing you can, either, you can either be on or off, zero or one. In quantum computing you can be both, neither, or all of the above. That's, 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 that's the depth to I, which I can go. I like that. That was actually as succinct as humanly possible, right? really. Sounds yeah. like a Ponzi scheme to me. I'm, I'm not sure if I... Well, let's get into some of the uh, thoughts that you guys have on some of the papers we saw, Savannah, and Dave, your perspective on this whole next level kind of expansion uh, with supercomputing super and super cloud and super apps will do for this next gen. What use cases are kind of shining out of this? Because, you know, it used to be you were limited by how much gear you had stacked up, how big the server could be, the supercomputer. Now you got large scale cloud computing, you got the ability to have different subsystems like advances in networking. So you're seeing a new architectural, almost bigger supercomputing isn't just a machine. It's a collection of machines, it's a collection of, yeah. of other stuff. What's your thoughts on these, this architecture and then the use cases that are going to emerge that were not gettable before? So in the past, you, you talk about you know, 1988 and, and you know, let's say a decade ago, um, the race was to assemble enough compute power to be able to do things quickly enough to be practical. So we knew that if we applied software to hardware, we could get an answer to a problem because we were asking very, very specific questions and how quickly we got the answer would determine whether it was practical to pursue it or not. So if something took a day instead of a month, okay, fantastic. But now we've reached this critical mass, you could argue when that happened, but definitely I think we're there, where things like artificial intelligence and machine learning are the core of what we're doing. We're not just simply asking systems to deliver defined answers, we're asking them to learn from their experiences, it starts getting a little spooky, and we're asking them to tease yeah. insights out in a way that we haven't figured out. So, we're saying, give us the insight. We're not telling the system specifically how to give us that insight. So I think that's, that's the fundamental difference. That's the frontier, is uh, you're going to hear a lot about AI and ML, mm -hmm. and then if you retreat back a bit from supercomputing, you're in the realm of high performance computing, which is sort of junior version of supercomputing. It's instead of the billion dollar system, it's the system that you know, schlubs like, uh, <laughs> like, like, like Facebook or AWS might be able to afford. You know, maybe, maybe $100 million for a system. Casual. Uh, ca just, just sort of casual Pocket kind of thing case. next to the coffee table in the living room. Uh, but I think that's really going to be the talk. So that's a huge tent when you talk about AI and ML. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. We're having some of the conversations that we've had for a long time about AI and bias. I saw a lot of the papers were looking at that. I think that's, what's going to be really interesting, to me what's most exciting about this is, how are we pulling together all of this on a global scale? So I'm excited to see how supercomputing impacts climate change. Our ability to monitor environmental conditions around the globe and different governments and bodies can all combine and all of this information can be going into a central brain and learning from it and figuring out how we can make the world a better place. We're learning about the body. There's a lot of people doing molecular biology yeah. and sequencing of the genome here. We've got, there's, there's, it's just, it's very, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that supercomputing pretty much touches every aspect of our lives. I mean, we've had it, we've had it for a while. I think cloud computing took a lot of the attention given that that brought in massive capabilities, a lot of agility. And I think what's interesting here at this show, if you look at you know, what's going on from the, I guess, like I said, from the dorm room to the boardroom, everyone's here, but you look at what's actually going on above the hardware. CNCF is here, they have a booth. The whole cloud native software business. It's going to be interesting to see how the software 
business takes advantage totally. of how these architectures, because let's face it, I've never heard That's a developer a say, I want to run on slower hardware. <laughs> so no one wants that. So now, if you abstract Great. away the hardware, as we know with, with cloud computing and DevOps, cloud, on-premises, mm -hmm. and edge, David, this is like, this is again nirvana for the industry because you want the time. fastest possible compute system for the software. Yeah, yeah. I, At the I, end of the day, that's what we're talking about. So I asked, I asked the uh, the gift question to my Wharton students this morning on a call, and I, you know, I asked specifically if if I could give you something that was the result of supercomputing's amazing nature. What would it be? Would it be personalized therapeutics in healthcare? Would it be something related to climate, being able to figure out exactly what we can do? Um, there's a whole range of possibilities, and what's interesting is. Uh, what were some of the answers? So, so, so a lot of the answers. <laughs> a lot of the answers came down to uh, to two categories, and it was really it was healthcare and climate. Yeah. Uh, a lot of a lot of understanding, um, and of course, uh, and of course, a lot of jokes about how eventually supercomputers will determine that the problem is people. It's people. Yeah. No, I knew you were headed there. <laughs> but I mean, uh, don't people just want custom genes? Yeah, or, well, so, so one, of the, one of the good ones though was, was, yes, was uh, also that, yeah. while we're here. <laughs> so a, a person from a company who shall not be named uh, uh, said, oh, advertising. It was, the, it was the what if you could predict with a high degree of certainty that when you sent someone an email yeah. saying, hey, do you want to buy this? They would say, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> Dramatically lowering the cost of yeah. acquisition for an individual customer as an yeah. example. Um, those are the kinds of breakthroughs that will transform how we live because all of a sudden industries are completely disrupted. Yeah. disrupted. Not necessarily yeah. directly related to supercomputing, but if you think about automating the entire fleet of, of, of trucks in, in North America, what does that do to people who currently drive those trucks? Yeah. So there are, there are societal questions at hand that I don't necessarily know the academics are, 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 are considering when they're thinking what's possible. Well, I think, I think the point about the ad thing brings up the whole cultural shift that's going on from the old generation of, hey, let's use our best minds in the industry to figure out how to place an ad at the right place and the right pixel at the right time versus solving real problems like climate change, our, you know, culture and society and get us getting along as a country and world. Uh, water, sustainability, fires in California. Yeah. I mean, come on. There's a lot, so I, I got to say, I was curious when you were uh, playing with your pocket computer there and talking about the terabyte that you have inside. So back in 1988, when supercomputing started, the first show was in Orlando. It was actually the same four days that we're here right now. I was born in 1988, if we're just talking about how great 1988 is. And so I guess I, I was- So were we, Savannah, the, so were we. I, I think I was in third grade at that <laughs> yeah. time. We won't, tell, we won't say what you told me earlier about 1988 for you. <laughs> but that said, so 1988 was when Steve Jobs released the next computer. He was out of Apple at that time. Yeah, that's right. Eight uh, megabytes of RAM. It was called the Cube, I think. It's respectable. That's all. It was. It was. It was. It was. Uh, it was the Cube, which is pretty pretty exciting. But when we're looking at, um, yeah, on the supercomputing side, your phone would have been about as uh, capable. So where will we be in 20 years? It's amazing. Well, we're will our holograms be here instead of us physically I, sitting probably. at the table? I don't know. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see how the global ecosystem evolves. It used to be very nationalistic culture with computing. I think, I think we're going to see global um, you know, flattening of culture relative to computing. I think space will Hopefully, be a massive, yeah. massive discussion. I think software and automation will be at levels we don't even see. So I think software to me, I'm looking at the, the enablement of this supercomputing show in terms of the next five years. What are they going to do to enable more faster, intelligent horsepower. And, and what does that look like? Is it, it used to be simple. Processor, more processors, more threads, multi-cores, and then stuff around it. I think this is where I think it's going to shift to more network computing, network processing, edge, latency, physics is involved. I mean, every, everything you can squeeze out of the physics will be yeah. interesting to watch. Well, when we, when, we, when we peel back the cover on the actual pieces of hardware that are driving this revolution. Um, paral parallelizing you know, of workloads is critical to this. It's what supercomputing consists of. There's no such thing as a supercomputer sitting by itself on a table, even the million dollar system from Dell, which is 
crazy right. when you hear Dell and million dollar mm -hmm. systems. And it's just chilling there too. Right, just, just hanging out. Yeah. But, but it's all about the interconnect. Um, when you want to take advantage of parallel processing, you have to have software that can leverage all of the resources and connectivity becomes increasingly important. I think that's going to be a thread that we're going to see throughout the next few days um, with, the, uh, with the, you know, the motherboards, for lack of a lack of better term, um, allowing faster access to memory, faster access to CPU, GPU, DPU, um, networking, storage devices, plugging in, those all work together. But increasingly it's that connectivity layer that's critically important. Questions of uh, InfiniBand versus Ethernet. Um, RDMA over converged Ethernet, as an example. A lot of these architectural decisions are going to be based on power, cooling, density. Yeah. So, yeah. a lot, lot of details behind the scenes yeah. to make the magic happen. I think the power is going to be, you know, thinking 20 years out, hopefully everything here is powered sustainably 20 yeah. years from now, because power pull, I mean, these, <laughs> the more exciting things going on in your supercomputer, the power suck is massive. That yeah. When we were talking to Dell, they were saying that's one of the biggest problems, yeah, so, biggest and concerns gonna, for their customers. Gonna, and that's going to play into sustainability. So we've got a lot of great guests. We've got folks from Dell and the industry, a lot of the manufacturers, a lot of the hardware, software, uh, experts going to come on and share what's going on. You know, we did a, we did a post, Why Hardware Matters, a, a few months ago, Dave. Everyone's like, well it does, now more than ever. So we're going to get into it, it here at Supercomputing 22, where the hardware matters, faster, power, as we say, for the applications. Mr. Cube, we'll be back with more live coverage. Stay with us.